uh, uh, Elizabeth, could you move to the uh, intro slide? Thank you. Uh, uh, welcome to the NFOSD Meet the Maker series. I'm Ed Steher, president of the NFOSD and a head and neck cancer survivor. Um, if you have participated in a NFOSD webinar previously, you are familiar with our practices. Um, you will be muted throughout the presentation, but are encouraged to ask questions using the question icon at any time during the presentation. There are 30 minutes reserved on this call for questions, so you don't have to be shy about asking. The Q&A will be facilitated by Elizabeth Daly, the NFOSD Executive Director. Uh, we will record this presentation and make it available on our website um, within the next few days. And lastly, there are no ASHA after CEUs provided, but you will receive a certificate of participation following the broadcast. Uh, with that, I want to provide a reminder that tonight's broadcast is for information and education purposes. Both the NFOSD and tonight's speaker uh, do not intend to provide any diagnostic or treatment advice or recommendations. If you need assistance identifying a swallowing specialist, please reach out to us uh, via email. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christine Payne, Vice President of Clinical Education and Research at Passe Bureau. Uh, Dr. Payne has over 25 years of experience in medical, academic, and industry settings. She regularly presents both domestically and internationally. In addition, she publishes in peer-reviewed and clinical journals and oversees the development of multimedia education on topics relative, uh, relevant to speech-language pathology, respiratory therapy, nursing, and other clinical professions. Uh, I'd like to provide a shout out to Passe Muir as one of the foundation's largest term sponsors. And with that, I will turn this over to Dr. Kim, who has graciously volunteered her time to present to our community this evening. So thank you. Thank you, Ed. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to talk with everyone and answer any questions they may have. I'm looking, sorry, something popped up on my screen real quick. So I'm just doing. So I'm going to go ahead and share my PowerPoint and get started um, so that I can get into the presentation. As we said, uh, we've got about 30 minutes of presentation and 30 minutes for Q&A, give or take a couple. So um, just one moment here and I'll get my Screen shared with you. Okay. And uh, get started so that we can talk a little bit. So, when I was asked by Elizabeth and Ed to join y'all today and talk a little bit, I wanted to come up with a topic that would cover 
kind of a, a couple of things. I wanted to cover tracheostomies and the speaking valve, the passive valve, because that's the company I'm coming on here from. But I wanted to make sure that it was really linked to swallowing and swallowing disorders and dysphagia in different patient populations. And so the information I'm actually going to talk about covers the age span from infants to adults. It, the points are for consideration for any age um, and really any diagnosis that has a tracheostomy and how that tracheostomy uh, may impact things. Now, um, Ed did a really nice introduction of me, so I don't have to go into a lot of detail there. I am a speech pathologist by trade, and I practiced for a number of years in two different uh, level one trauma centers. So I bring information to you from both the clinical standpoint, the research side, and then now working in industry. Um, and I'm happy if anybody has questions, I'm happy to talk with you about how, how I transitioned in that. But uh, I've got my contact information on the screen. I'll give it again at the end. I'm always happy to speak with you or to answer questions. My I, disclosures are that I am full-time with Passy Mirror. I have no relevant non-financial disclosures. And I won't really speak to any other speaking valves during this um, talk, but if you have questions about a different type, feel free to ask. And if I can answer, I'll be happy to do so. If I cannot answer, then I'll try and find you a resource to help you out with that. I also have a disclosure, which is right in line with what Ed already shared with you. The content of this webinar is for your general educational information. It should not replace your clinical judgment if you're a clinician or the judgment of the treating physicians or the healthcare professionals um, that are working with you. So it should not be considered medical advice. So let's go ahead and just jump right in so that we make sure we get all the content in. I first wanna talk about just a tracheostomy itself. Uh, the tracheostomy is becoming, it's always been around, it's, it's one of, it's actually the oldest surgical procedure ever. It's first documented back in uh, BC. So it's, it's a very old <laughs> surgical procedure. But most recently, it's occurring with greater incidence. And this is because we first have advances in medical intervention. And so pediatrics in infants and children, um, they're surviving younger and younger, and we're surviving older and older. And that's part of what's leading to some more tracheostomies. We also have a higher incident rate occurring because of COVID. Uh, with the pandemic, there was, a, as you know, a much greater incidence of ventilator use, and some of that in many patients led to tracheostomy. And so we're seeing more and more tracheostomies and the impacts that those can have on uh, people. And we even are seeing long-term tracheostomies in children and adults. But I want to just point out a little caveat here. With adults, when they get a tracheostomy and it's long-term, we work with them to restore functions that they've had. Unfortunately, with infants and very young children, they don't have anything to kind of fall back on that we're working to restore. Instead, they're in the development phase if they're very young, if we're looking at like infants and toddlers. And research has shown that the tracheostomy in pediatrics is associated with a delayed acquisition of language and social development. And it can even impact parent and child bonding and lead to communication impairments in very, very young children. So that's just kind of a general um, idea or thought for you to have in mind with tracheostomies. But one of the things that we can do is work to restore more normal function, which is part of what we're going to talk about today. The other implication from a tracheostomy tube is whether or not that tracheostomy tube has a cuff. In the image that you see here, this tracheostomy tube that's in the airway, this is what is the cuff, this balloon that's on the tracheostomy tube. And the purpose of that balloon is to seal the airway for mechanical ventilation. When a patient is on a ventilator and needing that to help support the respiration, that cuff in adults is typically inflated. Sometimes in pediatrics, you may not have a cuff or you may not have that cuff inflated. But we're gonna focus on the cuff inflation because the po point, like I said, is to seal the airway for mechanical ventilation. But that cuff alone 
can impact swallowing. So a patient who has a tracheostomy with a cuffed trach tube and that cuff is inflated, here are some points to consider. One is that cuff has air placed in it is the most common. They can also be water filled, but we're gonna focus on the air filled. Um, when that air is placed into the cuff, that is inflating the cuff in order to seal the airway. You only need enough in there, just enough to seal the airway. Unfortunately, that cuff pressure is often not regulated. It's not monitored or checked. Um, people use a syringe and they put air in and they take air out and they put back what they took out. And we don't know what's going on in the airway. And why that's important are a few things. One, if that cuff is overinflated, like we see in this photo on the screen, it can push on the posterior wall. Our trachea is C-rings and there's an opening at the posterior aspect with mucosal tissue that's very soft and pliable. So when you overinflate that cuff, it can actually push into that tissue and that can push that tissue back into the esophagus like you see here inside the black circle. It's pushing backwards and it can impinge on the esophagus. And what this can lead to is when, you're, when someone's swallowing, the food and liquid can actually get stuck right at that point, right above that impingement. And then if it builds up or it doesn't get processed down, it can actually backflow and spill over potentially into the airway leading to some other complications because food and liquid shouldn't be going in our airway. Um, so this is one issue with that cuff. Another is if it's overinflated, it can cause injury to the tracheal walls. It can actually weaken those walls so that they don't um, stay open as easily and they kind of collapse in. It can lead to what's called laryngeal tethering. If that cuff is overinflated, it can actually anchor the larynx down. And when we swallow, our larynx, which is the voice box, elevates and rocks forward to help protect the airway. It comes up and it rocks forward to help get closure of this upper area of the airway so that food and liquid won't go in the airway. But if it can't, elevate and rock forward, then it doesn't activate that protection as easily. And if that cuff is overinflated, that can happen. One last point I wanna share, there's a study that was published in 2012 by Amethal et al. And they investigated that cuff pressure and the relationship to swallowing. And what they found was the higher the pressure in that cuff, the more, impact on swallowing, the worse the swallowing was. So they found that at a cuff pressure of 20 to 25, which would be in the normal range, it didn't have so much of an impact in, on swallowing. But if the cuff pressure went anything above that, and the more it went above that, the more difficult the swallow became and the more risky, I'll say, the swallow was. There wasn't as much protection of the airway. So if a patient has a tracheostomy tube, one of the very first things you want to look at is, does it have a cuff? And does, is that cuff inflated? And then how's that cuff being managed? So I like to share that just because it has such a significant impact on um, the patient's, or I'll say it has a potential significant impact on the patient's swallowing. Then another factor about that cuff to be aware of is if you have a speaking valve or if someone's going to be evaluated for use of a speaking valve, then that cuff has to be deflated. Now that does not matter what type of speaking valve. Um, at this point, I'm not talking brand, I'm just talking about any speaking valve. Anything being placed on the end of this tracheostomy tube here, um, what that's doing is it's redirecting airflow up to the mouth and nose. You can no longer exhale sufficiently out this trach tube. With a passimere valve that you see here in the image, 100% of exhalation has to be able to go up and out the mouth and nose if the valve is on. So you have to have that cuff deflated and you have to have space in this airway around that tracheostomy tube to allow that airflow. So that's just a couple of thoughts there about the cuff. Now let's get into a little bit more detail about the trachs and its effects on pressure and what we're looking at. When a patient has an open tracheostomy tube, this is what their speech can sound like. And now patients can sound all kinds of ways, an open trach tube, they may have no voicing, 
They can have limited voicing. They can have a pretty strong voice. But I'm going to talk about her voice after you listen to this. I do apologize ahead. When we did a practice run just beforehand, the sound on the video is a little hard to hear. So just if you can, you know, listen carefully or cut out extraneous noise. But here's this video real quick. So this is a patient with an open trach tube, no speaking valve on, and the cuff is deflated. So this is Mrs. Duval with her valve off. Mrs. Duval, would you like to try to say something? I knew that I could not communicate with my parents. So I put them. Right. One of the things you may notice, she can't get a whole lot out at a time. As she's trying to speak, there, she's short of breath. She can only get one or two words out, sometimes only a syllable, and then her voice kind of fades away. This is pressure related. She doesn't have the breath support, the pressure behind that breath to help keep her voice strong and going. That's because she's got air coming out her mouth and nose and air is escaping out the tracheostomy tube. If we place a speaking valve, on that tracheostomy tube and get that airflow up to the mouth and nose, as I mentioned a moment ago, here's the change in her voice just a few seconds later. So this is Mrs. Duval with her valve on. Now let's hear you talk now. And now they understand everything I'm saying. Yeah, it's much better, isn't it? talk much better, yes. Yeah, and how about talking with your doctor? Yes, I can talk to him. He understands everything I'm talking about. And so hopefully you caught there, she gets the whole sentences out. She's not, you know, short of breath. She's not having to breathe in this upper region using her clavicular breathing and kind of using her shoulders to help with that breath. She's actually just able to get a complete sentence out. Why is she able to do that? Well, let's look at that for just a moment because this really gets it, starts getting into that kind of pressure regulation idea. The, when we have a trach tube with the cuff inflated like the image on the left, you've got the air coming in and out through the tracheostomy tube. When we deflate that cuff, we've got air going in and out through the trach tube and a little bit coming out the mouth. But when we place a valve, what we've done, uh, when you place the Passimir valve, you've got air coming in through the tracheostomy tube on inhalation when they're taking that good deep breath in, but 100% the blue lines, 100% of that exhalation is up and out through the mouth and nose. So we, we've restored the more normal flow of air through the voice box, through the vocal folds to help with that voicing and to help sustain the breast support that's needed for speech. Now let's get a little bit into why that happens and what all this means from a swallowing standpoint. When the, you use the valve, and I've got a picture of it here in the upper right-hand corner, the valve is what's called bias closed, no leak. It only opens on inspiration and it automatically closes at the inspirate at the end of inspiration, which is what redirects that airflow to the upper airway. So for a patient to use it, the first thing we do is we want to assess their airway patency, make sure they can get air around that trach tube and up and out through the mouth and nose. If a patient has an obstruction, they have something that's occluding that upper airway, obstructing the upper airway, you may see this. Uh, with a lot of swelling, tumors, uh, granulation tissue, that tracheomalacia, the weakened tracheal walls if they're collapsing in, anything up there that's obstructing the airway and they can't exhale out the mouth and nose, they're not a speaking valve candidate. But if we can get that airflow around the trach tube and up and out through the mouth and nose, then we can look at using a speaking valve. The advantage to doing so is that once we close that system, meaning we have put something on that trach tube and we're redirecting air up and out the mouth and nose, we're restoring a more normal system. It's not 100% because they're still using the trach tube, but we're getting that airflow up to the mouth and nose. Then we can make our assessment and treatment plans just like we would for any other patient, whether they have a trach tube or not. And so we're wanting to restore that more normal function. And the reason we do is if they have an open trach tube, they have reduced airflow to the upper airway, there's reduced positive airway pressure, which is the air, that's the pressure needed 
to keep the lungs inflated well, and we have a reduction in the pressurized system. Our bodies are a pressurized system. We use pressure for everything. We have pressure behind our breast support to help with speech. Pressure is involved in swallowing to help move food and liquid through our oral cavity and through our pharynx and through our esophagus down to our stomachs. We have pressure involved in our thoracic and abdominal cavities to help us sit upright and hold ourselves in a nice posture. We use um, the, pressurized, the pressure in our uh, bodies to help balance when we're trying to be mobile or if you're just trying to sit upright or if you're trying to learn to transfer like bed to chair. All of these are pressure driven. Not only are those pressure driven, but so is even the ability like to go to the bathroom and have bowel movements. You need pressure to help bear down. You need pressure to be able to pick things up and lift. So pressure is, is essential to a lot of functions that we have. And that open trach tube, you don't have those pressures because air is just constantly leaking out the trach tube. So that can negatively affect all those things and more that I listed. If we can close that system, now we can have graded exhalation. Graded exhalation means you can control the air coming out your mouth and nose. This is what allows us to speak more quietly. It allows us to get louder because we can push more air out if we want. We're controlling that exhalation. We're regulating it. That pressure regulation affects feeding and swallowing because it's pressure that helps drive the food and liquid back and down and through our esophagus. And like I said, posture and balance, upper extremity force and strength. So we want to restore some of, of those functions. Here's a quick video to show you, to start out with the respiratory, like I was talking about, to show how we need pressure in our lungs. That helps with good gas exchange. It helps keep oxygen saturation levels where they need to be. And it decreases the risk of atelectasis. Atelectasis is a pretty common problem that develops in people with tracheostomies because their lungs aren't well ventilated, there's not enough pressure, and the alveoli are not being recruited into the breath. The alveoli are the little bitty sacs down in our lungs that help with that gas exchange. So this is a video of rabbit lungs that are on a ventilator. And if you look at these dark red areas, let me turn this sound down in case that is being heard. Um, if you look at these dark red areas, that's where the alveoli, those sacs in the lungs for gas exchange, are not being recruited into the breath. Now they're increasing pressure, and as they increase pressure, you see those dark red areas are going away, and the lungs are becoming these nice, pretty pink lung fields because they have the right amount of pressure. With an open trach tube, if that pressure is not controlled and regulated, then you might end up having some atelectasis or having areas of the lungs that are not involved in the breath. And that can lead to it taking longer to transition someone from a ventilator to off the ventilator. It can affect the ability to decannulate a patient down the road and take that tracheostomy tube out. We want to be able to really restore those pressures. This particular video that we're gonna look at is from a research study where they looked at the lung volumes, the actual air in the lungs. And on the left-hand side is a video of a patient with a valve without a speaking valve on and open trach tube. On the right-hand side, the patient has a speaking valve on, a Passimir valve on, and they've got that restored closed system. The blue that you're seeing represents the lung volumes. The more blue you see, the better the volumes in the lungs. And hopefully you're able to notice the one on the right has much more blue than the one on the left, and that's because that pressure is restored and there's better improvement in the breathing and the lung volumes. Now, I kept mentioning swallowing and the impact on swallowing, and it has an effect on every phase of swallowing physiology. It can affect the oral, even the oral prep, just in the sense of the patient's priming and the person's priming and kind of getting ready to take a bolus, their ability to you know, open their mouth and, and get ready only because if they're not, as an example, in infants, we see this, if they don't have good pressures and they can't hold their head up in space, excuse me, or they're delayed with sitting upright and their hands don't come free to be able to take hand to mouth, 
it can affect the development of that oral prep stage. In adults, it can affect it just from a priming standpoint, being able to sit upright and being able to be in a good posture um, for eating and drinking. But we also have impacts on the oral phase, pharyngeal phase, and esophageal phase. Why does it affect those? Well, one reason it impacts it is because from an infant standpoint, the suck, swallow, breathe pattern can be negatively affected. That ability to control and regulate that the inner oral pressure that's needed to suck. For an infant, that's sucking on a bottle. For an adult, that can be sucking through a straw and trying to pull up something. That having, just as, an, as one of the examples, we use that intraoral pressure to help with that bolus transition. Even once it's in our mouth, that pressure is what helps pull that bolus back. That pressure is also, oral pressure is also used for sound production. Like when we do a word like, um, pop versus bob, we're using a voicing, we're using, we're engaging our vocal folds. But what if we're doing something like s versus sh and having a sustained sound? We have to be able to regulate, remember that graded exhalation? We regulate that and we regulate the pressure that helps us sustain that sound. So, and even on our sound production with voicing, we have to be able to build that pressure below the vocal folds to help with that production. So that pressure regulation helps or impacts speech and feeding and swallowing. And our ability to regulate that airflow and to control it affects all of those. Not only does it affect speech and swallowing a little bit, but sensation, our ability to feel secretions, feel what's in our airway. If we don't have airflow going through that upper airway, uh, research has shown a reduction in sensation, a decrease in the awareness of things in our airway. And so that can negatively affect our ability to know that, say, secretions are building up in our throat. We need to clear them. Or if food and liquid goes the wrong way, if our sensation is diminished, we might not alert to it. We may not cough. We may have silent aspiration. Um, so it's really important to have that closed system to restore those functions. Uh, I've already talked about the positive airway pressure, and all of these contribute to secretion management. And secretion management, that ability to bring secretions up, feel them, cough them out, and clear them through the mouth, and then maybe use like a yank hour to suction them or to be able to just cough and spit. These are things that really um, affect quality of life and recovery, and even the transition. If we're looking at a patient more acute who's say in acute care, ICU, ventilator, transitioning to off the ventilator, or if we're looking at patients who are in a rehab or home setting, that ability to transition and progress them is strongly linked to secretion management. Research has also shown that the more secretion someone has, the higher the risk of aspiration. So we really want to work on uh, managing those secretions, and we can do so by closing the system, restoring a cough, a throat clear, airflow up to that upper airway, and that sensation and awareness. Here's a video, and I like to show this just this to give you the idea of that inner oral pressure. This is an infant. This is a normal, typical developing infant eating from a bottle, and look how fast that is. So if you think about it, if there's a little hiccup in that pressure regulation, or that airflow, then the coordination of that would be really difficult. Um, luckily, we are not eating and drinking quite that fast, but, but it certainly is something that can be impaired. This next slide is just giving you a breakdown of some of the areas research has shown are impaired from in swallow mechanics in patients who have tracheostomies. And this actually includes some pediatric and some adult and that's why you see some things like latch and suck for infants, but you can see more anterior spillage, you can have chewing issues, you can have um, less protection of the airway, so you have more laryngeal penetration, aspiration, food and liquid getting into the airway, decreased pharyngeal motility, there's not the pressure to pull that bolus and move it through the pharynx. Um, then from an esophageal standpoint, again, the motility, which is that ability to move the food and liquid down through the esophagus can be impaired. But you can also have more instances of reflux, 
Um, they can have a higher risk of strictures and atresia developing where there's not the room for things to go through because of that um, decreased uh, pressurized system and that uh, not having the support really necessary to maintain the proper function of these different phases of the swallow. So that's just kind of highlighting a few of them. So I'm gonna do, I know you've already, um, depending on which webinars you've watched, you may have seen some videos of swallow studies. I'm not gonna teach about studies. I would just wanna show this from a pressure standpoint. We've got two swallow studies here. The one on the left is the swallow study of a trach patient. You can see the trach here in the video. And we're looking to see if food and liquid, it should come straight down the back, right in front of the spinal cord. This is your spine, should come right here. We should not see anything move forward and come this way. This is an open tracheostomy tube, no speaking valve. So we've got those decreased pressures. And I'm gonna play this real quick. So hopefully you just saw that stream come forward and pour down right here and it actually ran along the uh, posterior aspect of the trach tube right here. Uh, with that open trach tube, we have what's called aspiration. That particular video, it's a silent aspiration, but you had quite a bit of the liquid just kind of pour into the airway. Here's video two. This is the same patient during the same swallow study. The only change made at this point was placing a valve on. It's hard to see, but there's a little bit of an outline of the valve sitting on the end of the trach tube here. I'll play this video. And again, you're watching, you wanna see everything go this way. And you see every most everything go this way, a little flash, little teeny tiny smidges of stuff getting right in here, but nothing like what we saw in that first video. And at this point, the only difference made, there were no swallowing strategies. It was purely closing the system and restoring the more normal pressure. So in some patients, doing so can make a big difference if we restore, uh, restore those pressures. And I apologize, I think that video yeah, might play again. I, I clicked on the video instead of playing it on the screen, so that's why they popped up again. But we restore that pressure, we help to restore that, high, that laryngeal elevation and moving forward and help restore um, the pressures needed to take that bolus down and through. Another study used sometimes is FEES, and FEES has an advantage over the modified barium swallow study in some instances because we can actually look at that airway, we can see the vocal folds, we can look at the swallow timing and secretions. So let's look at this quick um, video clip here, and I'm gonna talk about it as it plays. This is a difficult one to see. These, this is the airway, kind of, well, <laughs> as it moves a little, the airway is kind of that dark hole right here in the portion of the screen. Look at all these secretions around. There are lots and lots of secretions. The clinician is having the patient swallow. There they just swallowed and nothing's happening with those secretions. This is with an open tracheostomy tube, not having the, the pressures needed for that pharyngeal motility to really push that bolus through. Then the valve was placed on during the same study and the patient was asked to swallow. And here is that same study, same patient. With, and after the valve was placed and the patient was asked to swallow, look at all those secretions have cleared out. And they've cleared out because of that pressure change, getting that pressure to help them drive that, those secretions through into the upper esophagus and kind of get them out from around uh, that airway. So again, this is just some of that idea of that needing to have that pressure to help with swallowing. And as I mentioned to you, if we have that pressure, then this can lead towards decannulation uh, for patients who potentially have that. Now, in some diagnoses, they have to maintain a tracheostomy, but the decannulation, the removal of a tracheostomy tube is a team decision. They often look at it occurring once the patient can use the upper airway to help sustain their ventilation. So getting the patient using that upper airway is a key piece of the decannulation. Um, and they start to show they don't have a need for other airway access. They don't need that tracheostomy tube. Some physicians even link swallowing to decannulation and they, won't, they don't want a patient to have that tracheostomy tube out until they can swallow 
somewhat efficiently. It doesn't have to be perfect, but they have to be able to have and, and show that they can protect the airway uh, better. And so it's a really key element to getting a tracheostomy tube out. In pediatrics, there's the addition of things like a sleep study. They'll often look at that to make sure the child can sleep through the night without difficulty. And for both populations, adult and peds, um, they often want to cap the tracheostomy tube, usually longer than 24 hours in order to see um, if the patient can breathe 100% of the time through the mouth and nose. Because a cap is solid, so where a speaking valve, you breathe in through the valve, out through the mouth and nose, a cap is solid, and you breathe 100% in and out the mouth and nose. So that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. In summary, individuals with trach tubes often have respiratory variables, um, including things like diminished or absent subglottic air pressure that's affecting their swallowing. So we wanna restore those pressures. If we do early intervention, we avoid things like disuse atrophy where the muscles are becoming weak just because they're not being used. We improve sensation and secretion management, we restore that pressurized system, which helps with interoral pressure, subglottic pressure, the lung pressures, the respiratory pressures, even esophageal pressure is being shown. And it improves phonation, postural control. So we're really getting that pressurized system re-engaged to help with a whole lot of um, functions. So like I said, a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, take, this will be in the recording, but take a screenshot of this, or if you've got your phone, snap a quick shot. If you want additional education, there's a lot of opportunities for free education. Um, we offer some live education. We have self-study that you can do on your own schedule, private webinars for facilities. We have some specialty workshops and seminars coming up through the end of 2023. So lots of opportunities for education on a range of topics to include courses focused on dysphagia, courses focused on how to use a speaking valve, um, ethics, all types of topics. And again, thank you. If you have any questions, um, my contact information again is on the screen. Feel free to get in touch. And I know we're gonna have some Q&A now, Elizabeth. So. Um, happy to answer any questions y'all have. Excellent. Kristen, thank you so much for presenting. I want to take a quick second here to recognize how challenging it can be to present to an audience that has such a, a wide background. We have people on the call who are caregivers of um, people still hospitalized with a, a new trach to people who have had a, a trach and have been using a speaking valve for 20 years to new clinicians to expert clinicians who have been in the field for years um, and that makes it challenging to address um, everything that you've covered this evening so thank you for doing that i have a few questions here i want to start with one that is swallowing related um, coming from a, a caregiver can you swallow while on the ve ventilator so if you have a mechanical ventilator are you able to swallow um the answer, well the short answer is yes um, patients who are on a ventilator are still swallowing, still have the function of swallow, unless they have a disease process or something going on um, in the brain that's making it impossible to swallow. So as an example, if there's something wrong at the brain stem, which really houses a lot of the control of swallowing, I mean, there can be other factors affecting it, but just a ventilator and just a tracheostomy tube, patients are still able to swallow. Um, it may not be pertinent to do that or to look at swallowing early because the challenge and the, and the primary need at the time is their respiratory status. So once they're stable enough, then that's something usually the team would start to look at. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, a question here from a speech pathologist. Once somebody has finished a meal who has the speaking valve on, should they take off the speaking valve? Um, actually, no, uh, not unless, I mean, if they're having difficulty, a lot of coughing and they need a break potentially, but having the valve on is restoring pressure, it's restoring sensation, and it's allowing them to cough and throat clear. So if they, uh, by chance, have a little residue, a little bit of food and liquid kind of left in their throat, it can help to clear that. And, or if they end up with reflux after the meal, it can help them have better sensation and actually potentially protect the airway better. So we actually recommend leaving the valve on um, after eating and drinking 
as long as their respiratory status, you know, and everything is appropriate for it. Excellent. Thank you. I have an advocacy question here for you. Somebody who works in a hospital, um, the physician on the team recommends that the cuff stays inflated because it's safer, because it prevents aspiration. Could you address how to go about this? Oh, this is my nemesis, my soapbox. Um, <laughs> so the cuff cannot and does not prevent aspiration. I had stopped sharing my screen, but I'm going to put it up and I'm going to show you why. That the physician needs education. Um, now, I will say if a patient has a high risk of a lot of reflux, a lot of um, emesis and vomiting, then having the cuff up can slow gastric contents from entering into the airway. So then that is something that might be um, beneficial. I think my, maybe my screen was, was it still, can you see my screen right now, Elizabeth? Now I can see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. So the reason I brought this up is the reason I say that the cuff cannot, I'll show you the left-hand image because the cuff is inflated. The vocal folds are right here. And the definition of aspiration is anything that passes the vocal folds. So the cuff is located well below the vocal folds. So there's no way for this to stop aspiration because it's already happened. Um, there's no way a cuff can prevent it because it passes the vocal folds. What they're probably thinking of is they're thinking that cuff is gonna catch anything that goes past the vocal folds and it's gonna sit right here. And that actually doesn't happen either. Some of it can if it's thicker and that type of thing, but the airway is dynamic. And as we breathe, our trachea expands and contracts around that cuff. And so we it opens the airway a little bit and closes back up. And usually there's um, aspiration occurring around that cuff. And that's been shown in research. The only thing that it can really do is stop that gross dumping of gastric contents into the stomach, I mean, into the lungs. Um, but stopping aspiration isn't, isn't going to happen. But if you have someone who's really at high, high risk, then it, it may be worth keeping the cuff up. Excellent. Thank you for addressing that. This next question here, before I ask it, I just wanted to highlight that there's three handouts that are attached to your toolbar um, that you have graciously shared with us, and you're welcome to download those. But this next question here is asking if you could highlight the difference between the greenish and the purple speaking valve. Sure. Um, the only difference, they function the exact same way. The only differences are the color of them and the shape of them. The aqua valve, the one that's kind of greenish that you mentioned, is the one that is designed, it's a little bit longer and skinnier, and it's designed to fit in line with ventilator circuitry. Um, it goes very easily into the tubing and is easy to adapt and be used with mechanical ventilation. However, it can be used off the ventilator or on the ventilator. It does not have to be, excuse me, used with a ventilator. Um, I actually have one sitting right here. So this one's the one you're talking about, the kind of greenish one. The purple one is um, functions the exact same way. It's just shaped a little differently and it's colored purple. And why is it purple? Because that is the company color. <laughs> There's no other reason. Um, the company just, that was the company color and they like that color, and so we have a purple valve. Excellent. Could you explain a little more how the one-way valve works? Is it like a screen where air comes through it, or does it go around the outside? Um, that's a good a good question too. So I'm going to hold this really. Can you, Elizabeth? Does that show pretty yep, well on your end? A little blurry, okay. but we can see. Yep. Okay. So on all the valves have the pie-shaped areas. You see the little pie shape. I don't know why I can't keep that in front of the camera little pie shaped openings and behind that is a little frosted kind of diaphragm that frosted diaphragm is in a closed position when you pick up a valve it is closed the diaphragm is in a closed position it only opens once it's put on a patient and they breathe in it only opens during active inspiration and so when they breathe in let me use a pen right here i don't let's see if you can see it that little um diaphragm piece in there can you see it moving potentially a little bit that folds back and airflow goes in in through this portion in the valve and goes through that into and through the tracheostomy tube and into the patient's airway and then when they stop breathing in it automatically closes and goes back to that closed position so that 
air cannot come, air cannot go the, into the valve this way. It cannot come back out. And so that's why they breathe out their mouth and nose. Follow-up question along a similar line here from a caregiver. If air can flow through, does that mean water can too? So not yep. getting it in the shower. Okay. Yes. So um, just like the tracheostomy tube, uh, the valve is not meant for, it does not protect from water. We actually recommend like he heated humidification so that they're breathing in moistened air. So like in a shower, this is not a shower cover. It's not going to protect the airway. Uh, they would still need to use a shower cover. Okay, excellent. Question here from a speech pathologist. Is there a significant difference in swallowing physiology with a trach versus right after decannulation? And would it be worthwhile to repeat a swallow study if somebody had some degree of dysphagia with their trach and now they're decannulated, would it be worthwhile to repeat a swallow evaluation? Yeah, that's a really good question. What I typically recommend and what I did in my practice so first of all, it, unfortunately, it's patient dependent um, and based on how significant of a swallow issue they have. However, it's, it is essential to keep in mind that when a patient becomes decannulated for a day or two, potentially a week or two, depending on how fast the stoma heals, they are back to an open system. They have an open hole in their neck and they are losing air at that point. Even with a bandage, they're still going to be losing some air at that point. So all of the pressure and the things I was talking about are back. They're diminished some again. And for some patients, that can be enough to negatively affect their swallow. Now, some patients have recovered enough and they're strong enough that they can kind of compensate for that for a couple of days. But it's well worth, what I always recommend is well worth screening the patient, not necessarily doing a full evaluation unless you see something that really looks changed but at least going in and doing like a bedside clinical swallow evaluation or at least a quick screen and kind of look to see that, you know, how strong is their voice? How strong is their cough? How strong is their throat clear? And do you think they're still able to protect their airway? Or with that open stoma, which happens, you'll have patients who are like, their cough becomes from this, <coughs> they get decannulated and their cough becomes, and it's just this little tiny puff of air. And then you're like, oh, they might not be protecting their airway, especially if they had dysphagia, you know, still have had dysphagia at the time of decannulation. So it's kind of patient specific, but I recommend at least screening. Excellent. Thank you. Those are some good considerations here. I'm going to try to group some of the next questions together here because we have some questions about candidacy. So who is appropriate for a speaking valve and what are some contraindications for wearing a speaking valve? Okay, good questions again. Um, I love all these questions. I like it being interactive. So the who's a candidate? Um, basically, any patient who is medically stable. And what we mean by medically stable, that does not mean they're off all medications and everything. It just means that they are, that they have stabilized them so that they don't have blood pressure going all over the place or heart rate going all over the place or there's a high risk of some sort of medical complication if they're stimulated then that would not be an appropriate patient. But a patient who's medically stable, they're doing well on their meds, you know, everything seems to be moving at a good course. That's it. And they, so they're medically stable. They have a patent airway. They have to be able to breathe around the trach tube and that has to be assessed. They're awake, alert, and attempting potentially to communicate. These are your ideal, that's your ideal patient. Um, with a tracheostomy as a candidate for a speaking valve. There are exceptions to the rule. There are, um, you have to look at each patient individually because, you know, one thing might be really great and the other thing might not be quite as good, but it all balances out. But generally speaking, that's, that's your criteria. Then for contraindications, the contraindications that are listed in the information for use booklet, which is what comes with the valve, and how it's um, registered is if you have a patient who's in a coma um, or unconscious, they are not appropriate. If they have an obstructed airway, um, they are not a candidate, meaning they, you know, if they have a tumor or a severe um, stenosis or tracheomalacia, something that's occluding that upper airway, like I talked about in the PowerPoint, if they have a foam cuff on their tracheostomy tube, 
There are a few of those floating around. So if that cuff is made of foam, they cannot use a speaking valve of any type because that foam cuff reinflates itself and is self, it's self-inflating. And so there's no way to deflate it for use of a speaking valve. Um, the, um, I'm forgetting several things here as I say this, sorry. My brain just, my brain stopped functioning. Um, coma, foam cuff, obstruction. Um, oh, uh, total laryngectomy is a contraindication. A patient with a total laryngectomy cannot use a speaking valve and you cannot use a valve. Um, well, those are the primary ones. Let me think about that. I might come back to that. Is there a timeline for how soon a patient can try a speaking valve after they've had a tracheostomy, tracheotomy? Yeah, the only, that there is, generally speaking, um, the guideline is 48 to 72 hours after the tra tracheostomy uh, tube placement. So after the tracheotomy, you've got um, 48 to 72 hours. And that's mainly to allow swelling to go down, um, active bleeding from the surgery and all to to become controlled. And that's the primary reason um, for waiting that time period. Some, But it also can be done on physician order. So sometimes there are instances that patients are able to use the valve a little bit sooner than that 48 to 72 hour time period. And some patients have to wait longer um, because their airway just isn't patent yet. There's not enough airflow in that airway. But, but generally speaking, 48 to 72 hours. Excellent. Back to swallowing here. Um, for patients that have trachs and wear speaking valves, are there any studies that compare aspiration pneumonia frequencies in patients that wear the valve while eating versus patients that don't wear the valve while eating with the trach? I'm thinking on that one. I don't off the top of my head know of any studies that specifically looked at the incidence of aspiration pneumonia with and without a valve use during meals or during PO. Um, I don't know of a study that has done that. I do. Most of the studies I know of um, with dysphagia have looked at a single instance. That would take, you know, that would be a longitudinal study and they'd have to kind of follow it over time. And most of the studies um, that I know of are looking at um, a time, point in time, like what happened during a modified or during a fees. Um, when they can actually kind of see what's occurring. I'll have to look into that, but I don't know of one. I will share, if you're in interested in what research is out there, we do have on our website a bibliography. It has over 200 studies listed on it. Um, it goes through 20, um, 2022. It might go through early 23 now. I can't remember if I have updated it yet. Of research, and it's got um, a legend of icons, and there's a red dysphagia icon. So every study that has that red dysphagia icon addressed swallowing in some way. And we try to include in that bibliography all the primary research. Um, we just screen it that it's actually on trachs and actually on speaking valves. And we try to include that research. Um, if it's a well-formed study, we do we do cut out ones that have serious flaws in them or you know have a fatal flaw. But that uh, but that's a nice resource. But I, I don't know of a study specific to that. It would be a good one though. <laughs> So if anybody out there would like to take yeah, that. Yeah, if anyone out there wants to do one, it'd be a good one. Yeah. Thank you some time, but it'd be a good one. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that bibliography. That's excellent to have that resource available. I'll send a link to that when I send a, a follow-up email after this webinar. We have so many questions here, Kristen, and I want to be mindful of your time. So I'm going to go back quick to the um, question that we had about contraindications. People are wondering if excessive secretions is a contraindication or not. That is the one I was forgetting, but let me explain that one. So I'm so glad you went back to that. It does have listed as, I knew there was one I was forgetting. It does have listed as a contraindication, um, copious secretions. But I wanna explain that because everybody's definition of copious secretions is different. What, what it really is, if you look at the full, what's printed in there is unmanageable copious secretions. And what that means is if a patient has so many secretions, you cannot suction them and you cannot control them in any way. You can't clear them out for a period of time. That is a that would be a contraindication. You, and it's, uh, and I left out a keyword. If they're copious, 
thick secretions, meaning they're very viscous and have a high risk of plugging or the patient is getting a lot of plugs, then that would be a contraindication for using the valve. But if you can manage those secretions, they're um, viscous, they're pretty thin, you can suction them um, regularly and kind of clear them for a period of time. Even if they've got a lot of secretions, they may still be able to use the valve. The valve can actually help start clearing those secretions. So you don't want to have that be eliminate them unless it's copious and thick and unmanageable and with a high risk of plugging. Awesome. Thanks for that clarification. A uh, question here about taking care of the speaking valve, and I'm going to group a few questions together. There's some patients and caregivers wondering how to clean the valve, and additionally, speech pathologists, myself included, let's say a patient coughs off the valve in the hospital setting, it falls out onto the floor. What should you do to clean that before popping that back on? Yeah, the cleaning instructions, um, it is not a sterile device, so all you have to do is you may, you uh, mix up warm soapy water. We recommend a dishwashing detergent. Dawn is the most tested one and does very well with cleaning the valves, a uh, Dawn dishwashing liquid. You put a few drops in warm water, not hot because hot can damage the valve. So just lukewarm water. You swish it around. It's like washing your hands and getting good hygiene. You swish it for about 20 seconds. Sing happy birthday once or twice and swish it around that whole time. Then you rinse it under running warm water, shake it off and let it air dry. If you have a patient, you're in the room and it fell off and they wanna put it right back on. If it hit the floor, I would clean it. It can go back on wet as long as you've shaken it off and there's no like puddle of water sitting inside the valve. Um, you can put it right back on anyone with it damp um, because that's just gonna add like humidity, you know, as they breathe in, we want moisture. So that's actually not an issue. Um, it does not have to become completely dry to use it. You do not wanna store it. All the valves come with a storage container and you do not want to close it up in this while it's wet. It needs to completely air dry before you store it because it could mold and mildew just like anything that gets closed up that's wet. But yeah, just soap and water basically. But Dawn dishwashing soap, do not use any kind of alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, do not use alcohol, do not use hydrogen peroxide, do not autoclave them or sterilize them, do not scrub them with a brush, do not use a Q-tip um, or anything like that to try and clean them because that can damage the diaphragm. How you know the valve is damaged is it makes a honking noise. Some people describe it as a quack, sounds like a duck quack, but it makes a kind of honking noise when it's worn. And if it's making that noise, clean it first because it may just need cleaning. And if that doesn't fix it, the valve may be damaged. But if the valve is properly cleaned and maintained, um, it should last for an extended period of time. Excellent. Um, last question here for you. Uh, maybe I might ask one more if that's okay. Oh um, yeah, I'm fine. If a patient can tolerate capping, so putting a, a cap on their trach, is there any reason that a speaking valve would be more beneficial for them to use? Nope. The only, I, I say no as a quick answer, if they're tolerating capping without difficulty, then there is no advantage to using a speaking valve. Some patients don't tolerate the capping for extended periods of time because with a cap, they can only breathe around the tracheostomy tube, both on inhalation and exhalation. But with a speaking valve, they can breathe in through the trach tube, so they have a bigger diameter for inhalation. And so in some patients, they do better with the valve just because they can take better inhalatory, you know, inspiratory breaths. Um, but if the patient's doing well with capping, then there's no need to use a speaking valve. Excellent. Kristen, I just want to give you a second to brag about Passimir's customer service. If a clinician is working with a patient and has a question about the speaking valve or trachs, how to use it or they can't get it to work, can they contact you and what's the response usually like? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked because, um, yes, we have Monday through Friday, we offer, um, we have a phone line you can call in. We have clinicians, I was going to say live clinicians, but hopefully they're alive if they're talking to you on the phone but it's not recordings. They put you through to a clinician. It would be either a respiratory therapist, a licensed respiratory therapist, or a, or a certified speech language pathologist. We take the call and we walk you through, answer, do the best, you know, help you with whatever your question is. Oftentimes that requires follow-up 
but um but yeah we're available monday through f friday um during work hours for phone calls now we're most of them are on eastern time we have one person on central one person on mountain so we try to we kind of cover the hours we cover we cover a good bit of hours thanks one final question here um mm -hmm. I know I said that twice now already. <laughs> You're good. I have no issues. It's a swallowing. Um, any guidelines on the timing of initiating a swallowing evaluation after a successful speaking valve trial? So, um, generally speaking, I hate I keep saying it's patient dependent, but it really is. If the patient's doing well at the time that you see them, like if you would think normally they'd be ready for a swallow evaluation, then go ahead and do the swallow evaluation. So what I mean is the valve just kind of closes the system. And if all things look good and look like if you're looking at that patient going, wow, I think swallowing should be looked at, then swallowing should probably be looked at. Um, you can do it the same day. You can do it in the same session. You can assess and place a valve and do the swallowing immediately following if they're tolerating and doing well, you know, with the valve and they have good airflow up to the upper airway. So, and you can also, I want to make sure to, to clarify this, patients do not have to have a valve in order to eat and drink. Um, ideally, we restore that system, but you do have patients who are able to eat and drink without a speaking valve. And so you want to look at both when you evaluate them, whether it's a modified or a fees, evaluate them with a valve on and with a valve off to see if they have to have that restriction on them. Um, some patients are able to protect their airway without a speaking valve. But ideally, you want to restore that normalized system and the cough and throat clear and the pressures and have them using a valve. But, but yeah, you can do it immediately if they're tolerating the valve well, if, you know, and they're alert and look like they should be eating and drinking. Wonderful. Excellent. Thank you for answering all of these questions. Oh, yeah. Our audience is so engaged. I know there's questions that I did not get a chance to ask. If you have a question, please feel free to reach out to Dr. King directly, or you can reach out to the foundation and we will direct your questions to them, um, to Passy Muir and to Dr. King. With that, Kristen, thank you so much for presenting. Oh, tonight. you're welcome. Yeah, and, and to that, again, my email was, it's pretty easy because it was just kking at passymuir.com. And so feel free to, yeah, email any questions or anything like that that you have. I will send out a, an email here this evening that includes your contact information and some resources that you have shared. It will also include a really brief survey. It takes less than three minutes. It's a three question survey. We appreciate any feedback that you have and ideas on future topics as well. We have two presentations scheduled for August. August 16th is our next Meet the Maker where we'll be hosting AMP Care. And then at the end of August on the 30th, I believe there will be a, a TAD talk on um, Zenker's diverticulum. So we welcome you to, to join us for that. I'll be sending out more information. Um, and with that, Dr. King, thank you again for joining us this evening. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. And I have to tell you, because I, I love your, I know what it's a spinoff of, but I still love TAD talk. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, hope I think that was this. a really cool <laughs> idea to do these. But and thank you everyone for joining. I really appreciate people getting on and, and listening and hopefully you got some tidbits that you can take and use. Yes, absolutely. All right, everybody have a great evening. Thanks for joining us and hope to see you again soon. Take care. Thanks. Bye, Elizabeth. Thank you.